Hi everyone, I'm Lalit Suresh from VMware Research, and today with my colleague Shidong Sun, we're going to tell you about our work on making Kubernetes controllers easier to test in the presence of various kinds of distributed systems faults. So the focus of this talk is going to be on Kubernetes controllers, which, as many of you are familiar, is very central to extending Kubernetes with new capabilities. For example, if we want to run a certain kind of database in a cloud-native way on Kubernetes, we would write a controller to manage that database in a cluster. Or we might add controllers to manage things, to add new kinds of container networking capabilities or new kinds of storage capabilities, right? So for the purpose of illustration in this talk, I'm just going to say, hey, let's have a controller manage something new that I'm writing called my app, whatever it is. So the standard way to go about this is to uh, register a new kind of resource in the Kubernetes API that describes an instance of my app. And this resource will have a spec field which says what the desired state of my app should be. Now the controller monitors the current state of my app and it issues different kinds of side effects in order to reconcile the desired state and current state of this my app instance. Right? And in order to do so, it might issue more commands back to the Kubernetes API, or it might use some kind of out-of-band mechanisms to reconfigure my app. Right? So now the catch here is that this controller is simply just one component in a fairly complex distributed system. So the And why is that? Because the Kubernetes API itself is actually a bunch of API servers uh, in a highly available setup, backed by a bunch of etcd instances, uh, where, which is really the persistent store for the actual cluster state. Now the controller, in order to do its job, might lean on some built-in controllers in Kubernetes. For example, it might be managing my app as a stateful set, and that will require an interaction with the stateful set controller in Kubernetes. Or it might even rely on third-party controllers, right? And my app itself might be this, like, might be a bunch of processes running in different pods representing something like, let's say, a distributed database or something, right? So the controller is just one entity in this fairly complex distributed system. And that means the controller is not immune from any of the uh, distributed systems he challenges uh, that any system has to deal with, right? Like a controller has to deal with all kinds of crashes. It has to uh, still do the right thing when some components are slow. It still has to deal with things like missed events or message losses because of, again, crashes, partition, bugs, and whatnot, right? Now, the tricky part is it's very hard to make the controller code robust to any of these kinds of faults, right? Like, it's hard to anticipate how things can go wrong. And when things do go wrong, the consequences can be fairly dire, right? Like, it's possible for a controller in the presence of these faults to make mistakes in its um, actions and cause things like volumes to be accidentally deleted or stateful sets to be accidentally deleted. And this can lead to problems like data loss, unavailability, resource leaks, and so forth, so on. And now the problem is that this is quite hard to actually test for, right? Like how do you make sure that your controller is robust to all these kinds of faults? And this is a hard problem in any distributed system because testing correctness in the presence of these faults is tricky. Because these bugs don't always happen on any instance of these faults, they happen when there's a very when they're injected in the middle of a very specific ordering of events. And in order to bridge this gap and make it easier for developers to test Kubernetes controllers in the presence of such faults, we've decided to embark on this project called Seaf. It's a project we started earlier this year. It's available on GitHub, and we released the code on a fairly permissive BSD2 license. And our vision is that uh, developers should be able to test their controllers for the presence of these type of distributed systems bugs at development time and catch the, these bugs before they ship it to production. And a key emphasis in the Sieve tool is an emphasis on ease of use. And this comes in two forms. We would like to make sure that developers do not have to make modifications to their controller source in order to avail of Sieve as a testing tool. And 
another emphasis given the nature of these bugs and how how specific an execution in terms of events and timing has to happen for the bug to manifest an important emphasis for us is on reproducibility if Steve finds a bug it sh you, you as a developer should be able to replay that execution over and over again on your laptop in order to study how it's happening why it's happening and develop a fix for it and anyone on your team should be able to do it so we've used Sieve to study several Kubernetes controllers already and across the board we've never had to make any source modifications and all the bugs we found in our process of hardening these controllers have been reported on that URL there you can reproduce any of those bugs at your own convenience right and we invite the community to join us help develop Sieve and make it a tool that we hope Kubernetes controllers will increasingly adopt so to give you a bit of background on like we will now move into a bit of background on how Sieve works. I'll give you a bit of an overview. And then my colleague Shudong will give you a demo of Sieve and it'll he'll show you how that works in the context of a couple of real world use cases. And then we'll move into some internals of how Sieve works. So first I'll give you a high level overview. So you might be wondering what exactly are we testing for, right? So given that this is a distributed system, we typically categorize correctness along two axes. So there's safety, which means nothing bad ever happens. And bad, of course, depends on the controller that you're trying to test, right? So for example, accidentally deleting volumes that make you lose data is a very bad outcome and you should try to avoid that. The other kind of axis is liveness, which is that eventually the system does what it's supposed to do. Like something good happens eventually. And in the context of a controller, this means that given a desired state and a, control and a current state, the controller should eventually drive the current state to match the current desired state, even though there have been some faults injected, right? Within reason, obviously. So how can we test controllers for both safety and liveness in a systematic fashion? So let me give you an overview of how Sieve works in this regard. So like I said, Sieve needs your controller. We don't expect you to modify any source code to avail of Sieve. Uh, you just have to tell Sieve how you build and deploy your tool and Sieve will take care of the rest. So now the first thing Sieve does with your controller is that it tries to go into what's called learning mode, where Sieve is trying to find out like, how can I, like when should I restart this particular controller in the middle of an execution to coax it into a certain buggy corner? or when do I have to lag an API server to confuse the controller? It's trying to learn these type of things about the controller that you've given to Sieve. And in order to do this, as you can imagine, Sieve needs to have control over the timing of events in the, in the Kubernetes cluster, and it needs to be able to trace the execution of the controller in this environment. And it needs to know every API object that was created, updated, deleted, and when these things happened. And so, we basically need two things from uh, in order to do this, right? So we, we make use of Kind, which is this tool to run mini Kubernetes clusters on your laptops. We're big fans of the tool. And so we use Kind to run a small Kubernetes cluster where we've basically instrumented the API service in a way that we can do the kind of tracing and timing control that I mentioned. And once you can deploy a controller inside this kind cluster, we require a test workload supplied by the developer. And this test workload is of course going to depend on the specific system we are talking about here. But if let's say your controller is a Cassandra operator, your test workload might be something like create an application, delete it and create it again. Right? And so now what Sieve does is that it takes this controller, it runs it inside, it runs it inside this client cluster and it replaces this test workload. And on the way, Sieve makes sure, make sure to automatically instrument the controller runtime and client go libraries that this controller is using in order to, again, trace the controller's execution and make sure it, we have a hook into its timings, right? So now Sieve does all of that. It runs the controller, it runs the test workload. It collects a bunch of traces. It analyzes the traces and then it outputs a bunch of configuration files. Each of these configuration files represents a suspected event sequence. Basically, it's an instance where Sieve saw some event sequence happening and thought, hmm, when this event happens, if I inject this particular fault, something's going to go wrong, right? It's basically a hunch that Sieve has. 
And a triggering event might be something like, hey, a stateful set with a particular description was created, and a fault might be crash the controller when that happens. Similarly, another trigger could be a pod with a particular description was created or updated or deleted or whatever, and the, the fault to inject might be, you know, de delay the API server when it happens, right? But it's always this pair of things. Now, once you have a bunch of these configurations, what you can do is you can switch to the testing mode. You can take this configuration, you can play it into sieve, but this time C will perturb the execution according to the triggering event and the fault described in the configuration file. And once Sieve does this, it's basically going to compare the traces that were produced in the learning run and the testing run. Or put differently, it's going to compare how the system behaved with and without the injected faults. And once that's done, Sieve can compare these two runs using a collection of general purpose checks that we provide. And in the future, we also hope that controller developers will basically um, supply their own assertions which embody domain-specific notions of safety and liveness. But one example of a general purpose but assertion that we provided so far uh, that we found to be quite effective actually is to just compare the set of all resources that were around at the end of the uh, learning runs and the testing runs. And the way this looks like, for example, you can actually compare the set of all volumes that were uh, created during this run. Um, with and without the faults, right? And Sieve might flag something like, hey, this volume with this particular name had 15 gigabytes of capacity at the end of the learning run, but in the testing run, it had 20 gigabytes of capacity. So what happened, right? So when Sieve detects these kinds of inconsistencies, it flags it, and then it complains, and this is usually uh, the pointer to the existence of a bug. And Sieve will tell you exactly why it thinks there's a bug there, and it'll give you some hints on how you might want to go about debugging it. But the catch is that this file, the self-contained file that describes the suspected timing sequence, you can rerun this over and over again. Uh, you can rerun the, the testing phase over and over again, and it's entirely reproducible. And you can pass this on to your colleagues if they want to reproduce this bug as well. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Shudong, who will show you an actual set of demos that reflect this workflow in the context of certain real-world use cases. Over to you, Shudong. Hello everyone, I'm Xu Dong, a PhD student from University of Illinois. And now let me do a demo to show you how we use Sieve to test the Cassandra controller and find out bug that causes resource leak. Let's go to the terminal. As mentioned before, the user to use Sieve needs to first run Sieve in a learning mode so that Sieve can learn about the controller's behavior and generate some event sequence, which will guide the later fault injection in the testing mode. So here, to use Sieve, let's just specify to make the Sieve tool to run in the learning mode. And also the user needs to specify the controller to run. Here we run this Cassandra operator. So this controller is open source and a very popular one for managing Cassandra application on top of Kubernetes. And we found the controller from GitHub. Here we use an alias Cassandra operator to represent uh, this controller instead of reviewing its true identity. The user also needs to specify a test workload, which is a scale down here to run. The scale down is a test workload written by us. It simply creates a Cassandra cluster with two replicas and later scale down to one replica. And of course, user can also use the existing end to end test for Sieve to run. And after typing these commands, uh, Sieve will uh, run the learning mode and uh, generate some event sequence, which encodes uh, where to inject what kind of fault. To save some time for this, Demo, we have already uh, run the command before. So let me directly show the results. The suspect event sequence is about automatically generated uh, in this folder. You can see the save generates in total 21 uh, event sequence fail uh, after running the learning mode. And each event sequence fail here uh, encodes a timing which save found promising to inject the faults. And since we get the event second file from the learning mode, we can directly run the testing mode to detect bugs. And similarly, we just specify C to run the testing mode. We use the same operator, the same test workload. The user can choose to specify a event sequence to run. If not specified, C will basically run the test workload for multiple times, and every time it will try a different event sequence generated in a learning mode, basically run for 21 times. And here, let's just uh, Run with this uh, particular event sequence file. 
and see what will happen. So after running the command, uh, C will start to do some setting up, deploying the operator, and then it will start to uh, run the test case. And at this moment, uh, you might be uh, wondering uh, what is inside this even second fail since we have been talking about for quite a long time. So let me show you the content here. So this is a folder the event sequence is generated, like we have 21. And we were using this uh, number 21. So let's cut the content here. So you will see that uh, this event sequence file actually contains uh, a lot of fields. And this actually looks quite complicated uh, to you, but don't worry because this event sequence file is automatically generated by C and uh, C will understand it and C will knows how to use it. Basically, during the testing run, C will uh, perform the photo injection testing according to this uh, event sequence file. And the test workload is still running. And you can see that C is trying to detect uh, absorbity gap spark. So where it's running, let me first explain to you what is absorbity gap spark. And we will go back to the terminal later to see the results. Observability gap spark is a bug pattern that we found, uh, which widely exists in many different controllers. It happens when the controller fails to reconcile to the desired final state, when it meets some particular intermediate state. Let's take a closer look at how controller works. We know that the controller maintains a local copy of the cluster state, which is denoted as S1 here. And besides, the controller also runs the reconciler internally. The reconciler is run like a loop. It basically checks the cluster state and uh, decides how to choose the desired state in the next step. The controller receives events from the API server and every event represents a resource creation, deletion, or update. And the controller will update the state according to the received event. And here it updates the event state from S1 to S2. Although controller may update the states uh, like for multiple times, a key property here is that uh, the reconciler might not observe every state updated by this controller by design. So for example, let's say if the reconciler at this moment is running slow and has not finished the previous reconcile. The reconciler, so it has not seen S2 yet. And later the controller receives a second event which updates the state from S2 to S3. And the controller only maintains one copy of the current cluster state. So after updating S2 to S3, the reconciler will ne uh, never be able to see S2. It has completely missed S2. And of course, uh, some other failures like the network issues, node crashes, can also make the reconciler uh, miss some intermediate states. Know that uh, the reconciler is supposed to be implemented in a fully level triggered manner. So even if the reconciler misses some intermediate, intermediate state, the desired final state should still be achieved. However, in practice, we found that uh, for many reconcilers, if they miss some particular intermediate state, the final state won't be achieved. And this is what we call observability gap spark. Testing observability gap spark is not easy because even during a very simple test workload run, there could be hundreds or even thousands of uh, cluster states ever appearing at the controller side. So an important question C needs to answer during the learning mode is that uh, for a given state S, will the reconciler go run if the cluster state S is missed by the reconciler? So basically collect the trees of the controller, analyze the trees and uh, uh, conduct some causality analysis and apply some heuristics to answer the question. And one of the heuristics we use here is that uh, C will pick a state S if it triggers a controller set effect. And here a set effect uh, represents a resource creation deletion update uh, made by the controller. And according to the analysis, C will generate a suspected event sequence which encodes uh, when to delete the reconciler to make the controller to make the reconciler miss a state S. And the suspect event sequence is used in the testing mode as we just typed. So you basically run test workloads and uh, make the reconciler miss the state S by injecting delay. At the end of the testing, C will compare the resource status during the learning run and the testing run. 
And if there's any inconsistency between the two runs, you will basically send the bug reports and there must be something wrong which makes uh, causes this inconsistency. And now let's go back to the terminal and see what seal found. So the test workload has finished it and seal reports one bug. So still found there's one inconsistency in terms of the size of the persistent volume claim, that is the PVC size, uh, after two runs. So after the learning run, which is a fault free run, there is only one PVC. But after the testing run, still found that so there are two PVC left. And we can try to get to the port and to see what's going on. So by getting the port, you will find that uh, except the operator port, there's only one Cassandra port running here. And recall that uh, we scale down the Cassandra cluster side from two to one. So one Cassandra port is actually correct. But if you try to get, uh, let's say the PVC number, you will find that uh, there are two PVC here. The first PVC is used by this uh, Cassandra port, but the second PVC is not used by anyone. So there must have been something wrong which causes this inconsistency and uh, makes this like all from PVC happening. But we don't know the root cause at the moment. To help us debug the problem, C will also provide some debugging suggestion. So here, C will tell us what happened during the testing run. It makes the reconcile miss the state, and the state is basically simplified by C. C will highlight that the state, uh, inside the state, this port has a non-new deletion timestamp and a 30 second deletion period seconds. C will suggest that we should check how the reconciler reacts when seeing this, this particular state. Uh, this, the reconciler may trigger, may issue some set effects, and the state might be canceled by some following events. So since Steve is highlighting the decision timestamp and the decision grace period second field, we simply search the source code um, uh, for these two keywords. And we found this piece of a code. The Cassandra controller checks if the Cassandra pod has a decision timestamp, which means that it's going to be deleted. They will delete the PVC used by this Cassandra pod. So this code looks fun, but there's a problem that the Cassandra pod does not have any finalizers. And this is what causes this problem. When we scale down the Cassandra cluster from two replicas to one replica, the controller first receives an update event which sets the decision timestamp of the port to S1. And now we update S1 to S2. And then still we will generate, we will inject some delay according to the suspect event sequence to a reconciler. So that reconciler will miss the decision timestamp. It has not seen the decision timestamp in S2 yet. And since the port does not have any finalizer, the Kubernetes will directly go ahead and delete the port. So very soon, the controller will receive a second event which delete the port from S2. And now in the new state S3, the port as well as decision timestamp is gone. And now the reconciler has completely missed the decision timestamp in the S2 and the reconciler will never be able to delete the PVC used by the deleted port. The bug causes a resource leak as the PVC is like left and won't be used by anyone. And it also prevents any future scale up issued by the user. The bug has been confirmed by the developer and has been fixed up by our patch, which is a finalizer to the port. Besides observability gaps bug, so we can also detect uh, other bugs of other different patterns, like time travel and automatic violations. We are not able to cover all the patterns in one demo. So for more detailed information about the patterns we haven't covered and the other bugs we found in other controllers, please refer to documentation in our repo. And next I will discuss about the internals of how C works. C is architected as follows. First, we have a save test driver which accepts a user command, set up the kind of cluster, and submit test workload. The test driver is implemented as Python script, as you'll see in the demo. And in the kind of cluster, every EPS server and the controller runs a SIEL client internally. They are able to do so because SIEL will automatically instrument the EPS server and the controller runtime library. The SIEL client collects the runtime information from the APS server and the controller side and report the information to the SIEL server during learning mode. SIEL server is the process running in the Kubernetes cluster and the SIEL server will gather all the information and the formal controller trees. 
and report the contrast trees to the cell analyzer. The analyzer will generate the suspected event sequence based on the controller trees. And later in the testing mode, CIF server will inject a fault according to the suspected event sequence generated by the analyzer. The analyzer is like the brewing of CIF, as it decides where to inject a what fault to trigger bugs. The input of the analyzer is a controller trees, including the events received by the controller, like uh, some stateful size or port creation. The side effect issued by the controller, like some service or PVC update, and some particular timing, like the reconcile stars and the reconcile ends. All those records are sorted in the real time ordering. The analyzer will conduct some causal analysis on these controller trees and generate some causality pairs. Each causality pair consists of an event and effect. The causal relationship between the event and effect is encoded in this pair. Basically, the analyzer infers that uh, the event received by the controller later lead to the effect issued by the controller. And depending on which pattern we want to test, C will pr perform different uh, processing and generate a suspect event sequence for different bug patterns. For example, for testing observability gaps bug, C will try to make the reconciler miss the state updated by a particular event if the event can lead to some side effect here. Finally, to conclude, we have introduced a seal, which is a tool to test your controller's correctness at the development time. Seal is easy to use as it requires no source modification from the developer, and it can reliably reproduce the bugs it found before. Seal is open source and GitHub. Seal runs in two modes, a learning mode, we are still learns about the controller's behavior and generate the event sequence. And the testing mode, where it inject a fault according to the event sequence and trigger bugs. We have shown a demo to you that's how we use Seal to test a real world Cassandra controller and find a bug. The bug has been confirmed by the developer and has been fixed by us. And finally, we have discussed about the architecture of how Seal works. Thanks for your attention. And finally, we prepared a few questions for you also. As a controller developer, are there any other bug patterns you would like to test for your controller? And what would make you feel comfortable using such a tool to test your controller? Please definitely let us know if you want to give serious spin. And we are more than happy to help you to test your controller with you. Thanks for your attention.